Hello, everybody, and welcome to Rare Conversations. My name is Brett Jenks. I'm the CEO of Rare. And for all of you who have attended Rare concert, uh, Conversations before, thanks for joining us again. And for those of you who are new to this, basically, we're just going to have a conversation. Uh, this is a, a series that we do, and the idea is to bring uh, leaders in the sustainability field, ask them a few questions, get to know them, and hopefully raise the bar on our collective level of understanding of a particular topic. In the past, we've had Heather White, uh, who's written a book about uh, individual behavior change and climate. Uh, we've had uh, the former president of Costa Rica, Carlos Alvarado, uh, the Kiss the Ground founder, Ryan Engelhart, and a host of others. Those are all available at rare.org. If you're interested, I see people are still uh, signing in. We've got a great turnout today. We'd love for you to answer the, the poll question. Uh, we're we're going to review the results in just a second and uh, just let us know uh, where you're from. So we have a lot to cover. We don't have a lot of time. So I'm going to jump right in by introducing uh, today's guest for Rare Conversations. So Bruce McNamer uh, is the president of Builders Initiative, which is the philanthropic team at Builders Vision. He's going to tell us what the difference is between those two things. Um, Builders Vision is an impact platform that's dedicated to supporting people and organizations uh, that are develop the building a more humane and healthy planet. Uh, Bruce manages a team of uh, program officers uh, that work across oceans, food, agriculture, energy, and we are really excited to dig in with him today on the topic of essentially how does philanthropy finance, uh, which is not a paradox, but how does philanthropy not only contribute to, but finance change uh, in our natural world. Um, and so with that, welcome, Bruce. It's great to have you here. Nice to see you, Brett. Good to be here. <clears throat> so I'm just going to kick it off with a, with a couple of basic questions. First, we want to get to know you a little bit. So uh, tell us about you. I, I looked at your uh, LinkedIn page. I've studied you assiduously, and I see that you, uh, you have, uh, you're overeducated, uh, degrees from Harvard and Stanford. How did you end up in rural uh, development and then philanthropy? Uh, well, I think uh, maybe for any of us, when we look backwards, it all makes sense. Um, you know, retrospect is a main is an amazing thing. But for me, it, it's um, like for most of us, it's I my upbringing. I was um, I was raised in Montana um, in a very Catholic family with a real kind of emphasis on service. It's kind of what you did, and that really stayed with me even as as I graduated college. I went and worked in investment banking uh, um, for a number of years, but. Uh, to the extent that uh, I left that and I was a Peace Corps volunteer um, in rural, rural, uh, pretty remote part of Paraguay, um, you know, subsistence farming and the like. And um, for me, that was sort of, I came to it naturally, but it was a transformative kind of experience uh, in terms of thinking about service, uh, but also in a very practical way. Um, I could see there having worked in business for a while and then being in a very poor rural there was actually a marriage to be made between what business and markets can do for uh, even in very, very, very poor places. And um, I've continued just to a lot of what I've done since has been a marriage of those two. It's like, how do we think about development? How do we think about giving people opportunity? And how do we think about the power of markets to actually transform uh, to affect that kind of change? So that that has really been a through line for me and continues to be the case. And, and I realize when I'm talking to Rare, I'm we're all singing from that from that particular song sheet. <clears throat> That's great. So when I first met you, Bruce, you were the CEO of TechnoServe, as I recall. And what, what, what I love about that and the story you just told is so TechnoServe was really bringing together uh, market sector analytics to try yeah. to figure out what what how, how to unleash the power of markets to promote rural development. So Peace Corps, investment banking, and rural Paraguay that all makes sense when you're the CEO of, of TechnoServe. So, so let me just jump ahead and say, now in your, this latest iteration, you work for one of the wealthiest people on the planet. You work for Lucas Walton in this uh, builder's ecosystem. What, what, has, what is different about this kind of role from your past? Um, well, I, I might say, uh, start with what's the same. Um, and, and that is... Um, this marriage of how do we make a difference in the world uh, and markets. Uh, and that's, and we'll, we'll talk more about it, but that's fundamentally what we're kind of about here at Builders. And that was one of the real 
attractions to me of coming to a place like this. I'd also say just about Lucas, the billionaire, uh, that Lucas is as comfortable in a rural or in a wilderness or an ocean setting as probably anybody on earth and, you know, could probably live off the land for six months to a year. So, uh, and he's uh, happiest when he's in those contexts and he cares deeply about protecting those contexts and the planet. And so there's a natural kind of affinity between, you know, that kind of passion and ways I've thought about like my, my own career. Um, and, you know, one of the differences is, uh, well, one fundamentally for me, like I don't have to fundraise anymore. Um, and Brad, I well, I don't we, miss. That. We salute you. We we <laughs> we salute you. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, also just a broader platform, and we'll talk more about it. But the kind of uh, so many of us work um, in, and so many people on this call work in uh, in our particular NGO or in investment capacity or in the like, and. That's where most of the world's work gets done. But we have actually multiple tools that we can kind of blend together in that, that draw from many of those lanes that in most instances, you're in your lane. But here, the opportunity really to kind of marry those is a different and a unique kind of opportunity. So so let's, we're, we're going to, we're going to, as they say, unpack that a little bit. These, these multiple, this blend, let's just call it, of these multiple, this, this toolbox that's, that's uh, diverse and um some of which is really proven, parts of it are, are still relatively novel. Uh, but first, I want to ask, so that we know who else is on this call, can we see the results, uh, Stephanie, from the poll, just to get a sense of who's here? So, okay, there's a whole bunch of people here. They're they're, they're going to line up out the door from the NGO world, um, because you have a, always a big target on your back as a, as a philanthropist. They're also here from the for-profit arena, so 27% from, from for-profit. Then you have a, the, the longer tail is uh, government, academia, foundation. Uh, I'm curious to, to to know what other is, but um, we may or may not get to that when we see what the questions are. So what what this sort of represents is, is you know, the audience for this conversation, thank you, Stephanie, is, is really who are the people from the for-profit arena with private capital, from the nonprofit arena with, with philanthropy, from government, with, with public uh, dollars, public support. And you mentioned the word blend. So what, what is it about the builder's ecosystem that, and, and why is it an ecosystem? Why is it not just a philanthropy? What is the ecosystem and, and what are some of the tools in that toolbox? Yeah. All right. Well, let me explain what builders is because um, most people won't know. Um, we didn't have a website until two years ago, but um, <laughs> we, got a great website now. Uh, Builder's Vision is kind of the impact platform for Lucas and our work here. And broadly speaking, Builder's has one mission, and that is shifting markets and minds for good, as we talked about at the outset here. Um, but multiple tools for doing that, um, as starting with S2G, uh, S2G Ventures, which is the oldest part of the organization, has been around for about 12 years. Lucas and, and colleagues got that going a while ago. Um, at directing for market returns, um, but sustainably um, in uh, sustainable food and ag, in healthy oceans, in energy transitions. Um, but they're directly they're direct investors. It's venture capital, it's private equity, project finance, real assets. Um, but they're directing in company. They're investing in companies. We have another asset management part of the platform. Again, mission aligned builders asset management, investing in public markets, investing in funds, and then. Builders Initiative, which I run, which is the philanthropic part of the organization. But again, as with S2G, investing in healthy oceans, investing in sustainable food and ag, investing in um, uh, energy transitions and climate equity. And when I say investing, we're actually doing investing and grant making in that context. So, and across that, uh, that platform, multiple pools of capital uh, and multiple ways of coming at these similar problems. So if you go across, if you go across that ecosystem, as I've called it, you, you start with S2G Ventures. It's just so the folks uh, on the on this call understand, what would be what's one signature investment, market seeking, uh, return seeking that S2G has made? What are, what are a couple of those? Well, one that people would be quite familiar with would be uh, Beyond Meat, um, which we exited a, a few years ago. But like protein alternatives, and how do we think um, about you know, that whole market segment and how do we think about it in a way that actually will 
galvanize broader uptake um, among consumers, but also uh, back along the kind of value chain that has to happen for for um, that kind of protein alternative to um, to uh, come into broad based consumption. So that's a very well known one. I'd cite another one, a recent investment that our colleagues on the ocean side uh, made, and that's in a in a company called Matter. Um, and Matter is a a company that is concerned about microplastics um, and their proliferation in oceans and has come up with a filter for washing machines, um, which right now it's standalone, but it'll soon be integrated uh, into washing machines and it filters microplastics. Um, and um, that may come for regulatory reasons, be kind of required in Europe at some point and maybe in the States. But we're excited, particularly I, I call out Matter because of this blend you talked about, Brad, and we'll talk about more because that was not our first investment in Matter. On the philanthropic side, we'd actually invested in Matter about a year and a half before uh, when it was a much riskier proposition um, and they were much earlier in the development uh, and they were far too early in this for S2G to take on. But we had a different way to come at it and a different way to engage with them. So uh, I kind of used, so this kind of opportunities across that spectrum of risk return and impact um, is part of what we're trying to do here. But I think that's a great example. I, 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 uh, I, I tend to work closely uh, on the on the advisory board of a foundation, uh, Jeremy and Hanalore Grantham's oh, foundation. Grantham. Great. And, oh, and amazing. Yeah, great. Yeah. Similarly, you know, within within the Grantham Foundation arena, just so people understand, Jeremy at one point was managing through GMO $120 billion worth of assets. So other people are investing. He's the money manager. His team are allocating resources and investing in you know, everything. Capital markets, could be private equity, could be venture capital. Then his foundation, so people understand that the foundation is required by the IRS to give out a certain amount annually. Well, that 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 tends to eat up, depending on the foundation, somewhere between four and six percent usually uh, of 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 those assets every year. But they continue to accrue. What you're talking about with the the investment you made, S two S two G made an investment in in Beyond Meat because it was market ready and you could see you could get a market return. When you say you invested in Matter in the early days, were you investing with grant money or were you mm. investing off the balance sheet of the foundation? Because that's yeah. where all this gets a little complicated, but also interesting. Well, it's worth exploring because um, Builders Initiative itself is a bit of a microcosm of uh, Builders Initiative of Builders Vision in that we do grant making, we do investing. On the investing side to your question, Brett, we, we also come at that different ways. So yes, and uh, we do it off of the foundation's balance sheet. We have uh, we have an endowment. We have uh, uh, assets in there, um, close to $2 billion in assets. Those assets are invested for impact, and they're about 95% at this point invested for impact. But Noel Lang's our CIO. And this is, you know, that is typically not the case. Um, it has historically been the case that you give, as you say, you give out 5% of your uh, assets annually for the mission and the rest was just let's go get market rate returns and irrespective of where those are invested we're invested for impact and market returns in that pool we have um but that's not kind of the end of our resources there we the matter uh, investment came out of a separate pool of money we call it builders bridge um and um that is not charitable tax advantaged money so it is not the foundation's assets um, Lucas has put a, 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 into a pool of assets here, a kind of a really high risk, potentially very high impact venture type investments, but funds and companies um, uh, in the spaces that we care about. And it's, it's important that for us and our model that we have that too, for many reasons, not the flexibility one, not the, but also thinking about conflicts of interest or self-dealing, things like this, like had we made an investment in matter out of our foundation, we wouldn't be in a position to make a, a similar investment out of S2G. That would be what they call self-dealing. It would be using tax advantage dollars to, you know, and now Lucas is an investor. What do you know? So uh, all of this out of, out of the endowment, we also use donor advised funds for further types of investments. And as you said at the outset, like 
What's unique about this platform is we get to do all that. And I am very mindful of that's a rare opportunity. Um, no pun intended. Um, just in as much as like the Granthams do this very well. But it's most of our people on our call won't have that opportunity. So we're also very keen to understand and we assiduously are looking for opportunities to do this with other people, to be blending these kind of either on a journey like with matter or in structured financing opportunities, where can our philanthropic capital uh, complement somebody else's market seeking uh, a capital or vice versa and those kinds of kind of opportunities. That's great. I, and I think just to sort of in summary and, and to play, play back the significance of this from from the perspective of someone who's been running an NGO for a long time, 20 years ago, I think it's fair to say philanthropists made their money with one side of their brain and gave it away with another side of their brain. And they gave away four or 5% a year. And the other 95% of that money, the assets in the foundation really were just put back into the market to maximize returns so they could give away more money. There, there wasn't much thought about uh, if, if you're trying to promote, uh, address climate change with your philanthropy, uh, are you investing 30% of, of your, your assets of the foundation into fossil fuel extraction? Uh, or are you uh, working on food systems and un investing in unsustainable food systems while you're actually trying to ref you know, promote sustainable agriculture? So what you just described is you've got philanthropic dollars, and you can use those in a variety of ways. You can make investments. You can make convertible grants to a university. Professor might have an idea. That idea is not ready for the market. No, no VC, no venture capitalist would invest. You might be able to get them out of academia into a small company, then get them ready, you know, and incubated well enough that they could then go seek uh, impact investors, eventually even uh, real uh, market seek uh, return seeking, you know, venture capital investment. So that lets you then think about an overwhelming array of opportunities. I would imagine it also gets very complicated. How many lawyers do you have to work with in order to manage all of yeah. the potential uh, yeah. conflicts involved here with all yeah. the other parties? Well, uh, just uh, just to pick up one thing before. Um, that that university, that college professor, like that is a very real example. I, we have invested at this point in, with grant dollars in about probably close to 20 accelerators or business incubators to take those folks um, and get them kind of up that kind of learning curve, the organizational kind of curve of like, how do I put a company together? So that's a very real and, and, and impression kind of example. On that, how many lawyers does it take? We, um, hundreds. Um, <laughs> It's actually not hundreds, but it's um, uh, but uh, we we're very purposeful in like making sure that as we deploy these tools, we're assiduous about like these conflict of interest or even appearance of it. And in our case, we literally have eight lawyers on staff, eight attorneys. And, and and I will tell you that Lucas, when he first talked to our general counsel, Lisa Forbes, he was bringing her on like I think it was five years ago, first lawyer, and they were looking at each other like. Do you think we'll have enough to do? Um, but it just this uh, the 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 growth of the business on all sides of the house. But just how do you make sure that you're uh, you know with integrity deploying these resources the way they're meant to be in, uh, de deployed is is not nothing. Um, and I we, again I realize that very few people have those kind of resources. But to the credit of Lisa now and her team of eight, they actually go out and they put on summits for p folks who are thinking about like. How do I manage this to be a clearinghouse for best practice on this kind of work? So you look around the community and you can see, we, we mentioned uh, Jeremy and Hanel or Grantham and Ramsey Ravenel who runs the foundation and Kevin Tidwell does a lot of the venture capital type investing. You have Noelle Lang as your chief investment officer. We've we've, we've known her and, and appreciated her for a long time. She came out of, I guess, Cambridge Associates. Then you have Sanjeev running S2G. You've got some other funds now. Peter, Brian now running an oceans fund. You're running the foundation. You've what is it like to have? So, so two questions, because it's not just Grantham and you, it's now Emerson Collective with Lorraine Powell Jobs and a whole host of others. 
But on the other side of the equation, you now have organizations like uh, the one I am so happy to be able to lead, Rare, where we have we've worked with you with for-profit dollars, mm, um, yeah. for-profit investing, um, with impact investing, with grant money. And at times, we also had to bring in lawyers so that we could paper these things to make sure that we were fulfilling all of our regulatory and legal and fiduciary you know, responsibilities. So my question to you is, how do you how do you make sure you have the talent necessary? And then what do you do about pay equity across this ecosystem? Because right. you might have someone expecting carry based on, you know, the billion dollar fund they're running and they're going to need to be paid as a fund manager like Wall on Wall Street. And then you have someone who might have grown up in the ranks of the, the nonprofit folks or a techno serve leader. How do you deal with parity and talent and 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 money within that ecosystem? Yeah, well, and and just, let me just say on talent, I work with some very talented colleagues, uh, many of whom, uh, you know, it's a wonderful opportunity you work with, but to combine kind of uh, impact with my professional aspirations in ways I might never have anticipated as I got into as a little Goldman Sachs thinking about what I, and here I am working for an impact platform, and I get to you know use those skills in the service of the the greater good. So. Um, we've managed to attract some very uh, to bring into the organization for very talented people. Your question about pay equity is 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 a uh, very salient one, I think, for anybody in this business. Um, it's something we think about a lot, um, particularly in as much as the encouragement here across from Lucas and all of us is like, how do we find ways to work together? Um, and uh, that is, we are down the hall. We are in investment committees. We probably we literally have 15, 20 different investment committees. Like, And there's interlocking membership. We have S2G members sitting uh, as advisors on a particular Builders Bridge investment committee and vice versa. I may sit on investment committees there. So that encouragement to collaborate and that uh, focus on impact. And yet the market would say, to your point, like, gee, you came from the hedge fund world. And I think uh, in the end, this is and and, and Kim Burris and and our uh, people team think about this a lot. And how do we reconcile that? And some of that is we're looking at new approaches to think about long term incentives for our kind of philanthropy colleagues as we think about what we're trying to build together that wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily find in the market. Um, we're constantly surveying the market, and um, it is um, one. I think we're, we're 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 getting good at it, and two, it is decidedly a work in progress. <clears throat> and part of the reason for all the lawyers is it's also new. I can remember when we first started working together with your the, with with builders when it had just been named builders, we were trying to figure out at rare how can we having established with philanthropic dollars in a number of countries better coastal fishery governance through our Fish Forever program. And you had been very supportive of that philanthropically. I think this was even before you joined the Builders uh, oh, community. Yeah. Yeah. And so we back with Lucas in the early days and Peter Bryan and others with the Walton family. We had figured out, well, we, we now know how to get better management of coastal ecosystems. We can help begin to restore and recover fisheries. Then the question for Rare as an NGO was, how are we going to bring in more public money? How are we going to bring in more private capital so that we can potentially scale what is actually now a working solution? And so for us, we got interested in what we call blended finance or innovative finance because we wanted to figure out how to take philanthropic capital, improve local governance and local capacity, and then eventually be able to bring in other dollars, other investors, private capital to scale more sustainable businesses that could benefit from and pay for themselves long-term from, from a better managed local ecosystem. And so our first deal, the Malloy Fund, oh, yeah. uh, we, yeah. what was, I remember- it's Famous we, we around were, here, by the way, but yeah. Infamous, uh, I'm sure. Famous. Infamous and famous. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, go it ahead. Really, yeah. So it was, it was really, really hard to pull off because, yeah. I, don't, I don't want to belabor this, but I want to use it as sort of a test case. Um, we actually put about $40,000, believe it or not, just to, to, just to illustrate one of these deals, these innovative finance deals, we put about $40,000 in, in, in unrestricted resources into a fund in the State Department so that the State Department could issue a credit guarantee 
so that we could go back to Jeremy Grantham and to Lucas Walton and a host of other inv investors slash philanthropists and say, usually as a nonprofit, we offer you a 100% loss on capital yeah. in exchange for impact. In this case, we're going to guarantee you the most we're going to lose is 50% because we have this credit guarantee. But the goal is eventually to be able to bring in others who will put money in a fund that we can invest in sustainably managed fishery enterprises that employ local people and that improve governance. And so we had to stack our own resources at Rare, State Department resources. Lucas even said, I'll, I'm going to put up $5 million towards a $22 million fund. But he, you know, he said very wisely early on, you guys are not going to be able to afford sufficient management. So I'm also going to provide a grant that will let you hire someone appropriate to manage this fund. And so in retrospect, that was crazy. And, and we, it, we had to explain it so many different ways. So, some people actually criticized us for, A, for doing something that we didn't have a competence in, B, mixing all this funding, C, uh, you know, bringing capitalism into what, what should be a, you know, a, a do-gooder institution. What are some of the things, what's your side of those kinds of stories? And what don't people understand about why it's so important to do, especially in the early stages? What are the misconceptions that you deal yeah. with? Yeah. Um, well, and one, just to, you know, put a point on like the Malloy Fund, what now, six years ago, seven years ago, is it? And making those kinds of investments um, and continuing to, even as with Deliberate Capital and your own guidance here, that management team is now managing a $500 million the global fund for coral for, for coral reefs. And, and so the trajectory of the Malloy Fund is not, as with any of these, is not what you might have predicted um, at the outset. Um, so, and I would just say that the very bespoke nature of what you put together um, it, with the Malloy Fund is, um, fortunately, unfortunately, it's still kind of the case, right? And it's, um, there are very few kind of off the shelf, we got your credit guarantee, we got your concessionary capital, we got your long-term offtake agreements. It's very often bespoke, um, but it is in the service of just what you set out to do. Because once that, once those businesses, those smallholder sometimes businesses are at scale and the supply chain, the value chain has been developed and there are buyers, those things begin to sustain themselves. Um, and then that's the beauty of the market. I would say, I don't think it's a market failure, but like getting things going in cap in, in a capital markets kind of world is a slow process until it's not. Um, so this is a story of venture capital, right? Or even seed stage investors, but like take it a step back to where many of the people on this phone call are living their lives. It's like, we don't get the economic model now. And even then, if we did, there's some market failures or market kind of uh, intransigence you got to overcome. And so people will continue to invest. I'm thinking of our own investment at a, in a climate world in, in something called Breakthrough Energy Catalyst, which is a, a Bill Gates uh, entity that um, is looking at decarbonization and different technologies related to that. Like, And these are technologies for which like the technology has been figured out. You know, it's around green hydrogen. It's around um, you know long, long, long life, life batteries. It's it, it's not the technology risk. It's like these are still kind of expensive. But we know if we can get them down that what what they call the green premium, uh, there's a massive market out there. But who's going to do that? And so it often takes. I mean, I think they've raised one and a half billion dollars. About half of that's grant capital. Some of that's our grant capital. And so they are now putting to work grant capital in, and uh, market return capital, sometimes stacking it in an, in project finance opportunities that wouldn't otherwise get funded, but you do two of them and you do three of them and now you got a pathway to uptake, uptake in the market. Um, and look, we do this and often in, in, in concert with other folks, like you had to go to USAID, you're putting this together partners. I mean, we're le now looking at a nature bond where you know, uh, with a sovereign who's thinking about like refinancing pretty expensive debt and 
we can come in with a, uh, the credit guarantee, the banks will lend at a much more attractive rate of interest and the difference could go for, for nature, but they do end up being bespoke. And uh, again, I don't want to come back to like, that's kind of what we're setting out to address because one opportunity with Malloy Fund, you're coming to builders. And if we don't got that, we can't help you. But now we increasingly got that. We got a flavor of that. Uh, that's helpful. We can do the grant. We can do the concessionary uh, capital. We maybe we'll do come in with a credit guarantee. And the good news in all this is that originally it might have been just the Granthams and maybe Lucas, but more and more people. So the ecosystem where people are coming in to help you build these, put these deals together, uh, is a richer one. Um, and it's thanks to you guys were pioneers and and, and helping to put, put some of this together. Yeah, thank you. And I remember when we, 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 you guys, I think it was your first uh, program related investment, your first PRI. Right. Yep. And I think it was Jeremy's too, because we had, we papered that and then sent it around and everybody sort of used the same lawyer to initially ink, ink the same <laughs> first deal. Now, so I think we're going to run into a problem where there's a lot of foundations who want to finance or invest in the deal. I think what I worry about jumping ahead another 10 years is, are, are we going to have all the people out there so fascinated by the opportunity to continue to grow the balance sheet with, that, that we lose sight of the fact that we still need some people buying outcomes? You know, we have a situation right now where we're issuing what we, what we I mean, we call, I don't think it's hyperbolic, we're calling the, the world's first uh, small scale fishery impact bond. And there's a lot of people. I was on. A, we were on a call the other day, and Peter Bryant, who works uh, with you, and Lucas was on the call, and we were joking that there's a lot of foundations now who want to, who will certainly want to invest, especially if they're going to get the corpus back plus interest, because then it just matches their impact investing, you know, you know, off the balance sheet model. And 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 what we we're sort of laughing about is how many are going to want to just pay for the outcome which is what philanthropy you know, obviously needs to be about. So I guess I wanna ask you to look ahead then. This ecosystem is now growing. The vocabulary is, is being developed. The, the, the number of examples, especially in energy, especially in climate, but hopefully increasingly with nature, you know, with, with ag, with, with, with um, carbon in the soil, with, with fisheries, oceans, Hopefully, we're going to continue to see a lot more innovative finance, you know, in with biodiversity. What do you think the system is going to need to look like? And so, what what does your ecosystem need to look like? And then, what advice do you have for the fifty percent of the folks on this call at NGOs who are who are seeing the landscape change? What do you advise us to think about? Well, I, boy, a few things. One is uh, to acknowledge that markets aren't going to solve everything. And God help us if we're all, it's all about markets, all markets all the time. There is, there is a public benefit. There is social goods there that you really ultimately can't even price. And, and, and we should all continue to care fundamentally about those questions of equity and the like. Not everything has a one. First thing. Uh, second thing I think that we are uh, think about a lot is, um, uh, and these are in a particular order, but data and how do we, um, and oh boy, we've been on a ride, haven't we, with respect to just capturing data in the first place in the natural world, satellite sensors, the various ways in which we can kind of get a much more granular sense of what's happening at the, you know, the, in the biochemistry of the soil and, and, and as we think about uh, detecting uh, emissions as we think about, you know, all, so the proliferation of data and then being able to kind of make sense of that. And um, as you think about what are the real opportunities here? And then I think another thing there we think a lot about is like, how are we working not just in markets, but on markets? And that is, I'm thinking about externalities. And that is the fact that like, you know, we can have an energy system that just cranks along and the oil and, you know, the Service providers make a certain amount of money, and this is how much it costs us. And meanwhile, the planet's on fire uh, because we just haven't priced that into the model here. And so how do we think about a regulatory context or voluntary markets where 
Now we're starting to think about the true cost and true benefits of nature, cost to and benefits from nature. Um, so, um, and I, I'm thinking of a, a particular, everybody on this call, many people must call be familiar with like carbon pricing and the like and voluntary markets, but um, maybe two years ago, three years during COVID, we did a deal with um, uh, quantified ventures where we financed uh, a, a deal where farmers in the Midwest were uh, being paid to not just in the voluntary market for sequestering carbon, but for water filtration. And they were being paid by downstream municipalities for not using synthetic fertilizer. And so now you're starting to get into a realm where, okay, there's a price for this. And I think that the kind of pricing of externalities, either in voluntary context or kind of requiring people to do it, um, they, two things we're watching uh, kind of very closely. Um, in the end, goodwill uh, will get you pretty far, but it's not going to get you all the way. I think what you guys do in terms of behavior change and thinking about building that into systems design and even as we think about investments, it's going to be very important, is, is and is going to be very important. But those are things I'm I and we are certainly keeping our eyes on uh, here, looking at over the next five to ten years. So I love I love the idea that um, uh, there's there's a saying in Spanish that I'm quite fond of, and that I was taught in Mexico when I lived there for a while. Según el sapo a la pedrada, which means for little kids, you you pick the rock based on the size of the frog you're trying to knock out of the tree. Forget <laughs> the forgive the violence, uh, but the point is you have you have a philanthropic pot of money that lets you, for example invest in governance, invest in capacity building. We probably shouldn't put any more money into the ocean unless there's good governance because you're just going to accelerate overfishing. You probably don't want a lot more money in agriculture in rural Latin America because it's going to, until you have better practices, better behaviors, better governance, otherwise you're just going to get more pesticides um, in the water. You're going to get more over exploitation. So you have philanthropy for governance you also have philanthropy for innovation pre-market. Then you have a couple of different kinds of, of, of catalytic capital, concessionary capital, or um, lower, lower, more, more uh, risk tolerant capital. And then eventually you have market, I'm oversimplifying. But so day to day then within your ecosystem, you are looking at oceans, food systems and agriculture, climate change, and you're thinking, with a systems view, I'm assuming, where's the weak point and what's the right capital to help address it? Yeah. If there's a solution, how do we scale it? If it's a tragedy of the commons, how do we boost governance? Is that is that fair to say that? And, and if so, what, how do you organize? Is there a one page cheat sheet so that everybody knows how the vision links to the pots of capital and how that links to decision-making? Because I can imagine this could get out of control pretty quickly. Well, it's actually it's PowerPoint deck, um, but um, <laughs> we'll be sending it out. After. No, it's a uh, no. But you're, you're right. How are we singing from the song, same song sheet? And we've been quite deliberate. Yeah, as with any startup, I think we got going with S2G and then we're Builders Asset Management and got Builders Initiative. And uh, but over the last two to three years, we've been much more kind of purposeful about saying what are what we call them our North Stars. Uh, in those three areas. And then what are the specific, to your point, these are systems problems, but what are the systems frictions that are relevant to maybe the tools that we would bring to bear? And then an increasing emphasis on um, how do then we as a platform amongst ourselves even think about addressing those, but then um, how are we engaging in the broader world? Because you know, systems change isn't gonna happen out of builder's vision. Um, we are actors, but these are trillion dollar markets, trillion dollar problems, trillion dollar opportunities. So, um, but how do we bring that kind of systems approach um, with the particular lens on kind of markets uh, uh, to bear? So our North Star, we've articulated those um, and we put together kind of in the, our own internal kind of measurement framework. How do we know how we're doing? What are our indicators for success against those? And even in the last you know, six months, we've, I mean, thinking new about enterprise strategy and, and really honing in on how do we in that process catalyze capital, right? Other people's capital and in many of the ways that you and I have been discussing on this call, but like, because ultimately as whatever resources we may have are dwarfed by, you know, call it the opportunity, the problem, trillions. Um, and so how do we catalyze, and, and Brett, in your the, the things you suggested, like we were trying to do, it's also government capital. Like, you know, how we bring government funding into the space. Um, 
And because of course, uh, government funding and regulation that would encourage particular types of investments, you know, tax credits and the like, um, uh, to kind of achieve the outcomes we want. So thinking, you know, we're trying to think much more systematically and learning from a lot of other people who've been in this for a while, like where are the levers for that? Um, uh, for, you know, a dollar in is followed by $2 of, you know, government is followed by market. You, you can think about the, the uh, kind of combinations of that, but how do we unlock capital? <clears throat> I'm going to jump to the, and crowdsource some questions here in just a sec. I'm gonna ask you one more uh, and and then hand it over. We've, we've got a bunch brewing in the, uh, in the, in the Q and a line and, and Stephanie, I'm going to ask you or Zach, when you're ready to, to, to uh, just field some of those questions. But my last question to you, Bruce, is there, there's a, as, as someone who's been in this space a long time, there, there is a, I think a growing sort of diversion in philanthropy Forget the financial constructs, but it's more of the 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 on one end of the spe spectrum, you have like a, a Mackenzie Scott who's saying, I'm going to give away all my money and I'm just going to give it to organizations and trust that they're going to that they're going to do the right thing. Um, and this is my way of, 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 of making a vote of confidence, you know, for the for the sector. And then there are other folks who say, until I am sure that I know the answer to how to solve the problem. And, and I have my strategy. I will not give out any money to subcontractors who will implement my vision. So you have sort of the the, the arrogant side of the equation and, and the humble, let's just oversimplify. It is, it, it's gotta be challenging. How do you balance right. the, the, the sort of confidence that comes with having a lot of money with the humility that knows most of the best ideas are probably not gonna come from inside the office? Yeah. Well, let's begin with that, because that that is a truism. I mean, if ever there was one, and I think we're continually aware of that, even in a context where, as you know, if you're the on the giving side of this, like, be wary, because, you know, everybody laughs at your jokes, right? It's like, um, so, um, but I, I think it comes from Lucas on down. It's like, are we listening to engage with the people who really do this? Um, and taking our lead from them and trying to deploy capital in the service of what it is they think we can actually get done together in the world. Now, on your spectrum of, now, I, I love what McKinsey Scott does because um, it, it is ultimately that, a real fulfillment of that. Um, and I think we're, and we're not even anywhere close to the, like, we got all the answers. I think we're somewhere in the middle. Um, and that is in two ways. One is just a particular sector focus. Like we, you know, we are focused in these sectors that we've been discussing. Um, and um, being able to do that with multiple tools um, at, and resources at scales mean ultimately we ourselves become a learning, a learning platform for what you can learn in this, on the market seeking side, on the grant making side, on the policy side. So we begin to have some insights that just come from a focus and from having particular strategies that we're trying to, to work against. Um, but even in that concept, we are giving into regranting. We just kicked off a, a, a pretty large scale oceans undertaking uh, called, called ORCA, not surprised. ORCA probably gets used for a lot of things in the oceans space for acronyms, but um, it's the Oceans Resilient, Resilience and Climate Alliance. It's $250 million in grant capital um, but a lot of that's just going to be redeployed immediately. I mean, regranted and working with both local organizations and international organizations that like we know know better. Um, and um, and we do a lot of kind of general operating support in that in in that same spirit. So um, I think it is somewhere in the middle, uh, as with so many things. But um, my hats off to the kind of spirit that animates uh, someone like a McK McKinsey Scott to say, I'm just you know, let's go right to the front lines. <laughs> Great. Okay. So thank you, Bruce. Let's, let's open it up to, uh, to the group. Stephanie, what, what do we have? Yeah. So here's a question from the Q and A looking at a different part of the pipeline. What is happening on creating more of a continuum of philanthropy from early stage to mezzanine to large scale as an NGO grows? So, so particularly targeting NGOs as the recipient. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I I think what I'd say about that is um, there there is a tension here. Let me just call it out, um, which isn't in your question, but um, 
for a philanthropy like ours with substantial resources um, to, to, to that we want to deploy um, to go only with the kind of the largest scale NGOs. Um, but in that, we lose a, a little bit of what I was just describing. Um, the, the the very front lines, particularly in an equity context too, where you know organizations that you know in you know historically underserved communities and the like like have never had the resources. And like so, we've asked ourselves from the start: How do we honor that, even as we're trying to deploy capital that they're not yet in a position to to really effectively deploy at the you know at at, at scale and a lot of that, um, that takes resources from our side, but real engagement and authentic engagement. And then it's the blocking and tackling that you would not be surprised by on that scaling. It is um, maybe not program specific, like we're not going to tell you how to deploy this capital, but uh, what are the kind of kind of operating kind of resources, you know, general operating support, you've got to hire a fund, you're going to hire a fundraiser with this, we're going to kind of give you the resources to deploy as you think on just scaling the business side of the house, even as you're thinking about the program side. Another aspect of that, which I think scale, we, we actually made a grant last year in the climate equity space to a local partner here. Um, it, as million, millions of federal dollars are coming down in term, with IRA and other things like the natural thing was to seek out the big NGOs and then they would regrant to the small. And uh, we actually flipped that on its head a little bit and with some additional resources, made a couple of grants where the smaller NGOs were taking the capital and then and then the subcontracting out to larger NGOs. And that puts you on a path uh, to begin to be able to scale. Um, the other thing I'd say about that is for an organization like ours, it's often tempting to say like, what's to sustain them? All philanthropists say, what's your long-term sustainability model? And particularly, we would ask that because we're about markets and is there a market dimension of this? But sometimes, you know, the long-term sustainable is just more donor financing. And that's fine because that's what it is. But building capacity and broadening the, the, uh, the kind of helping these organizations to broaden the ambit of like where they're looking for capital and where they can get it from the kind of individual donors who are to the institutional donors, to accessing government financing. Um, and even like on the S2G side of the house, we put together a platforms team to help our companies on that progression. Like, cause they're going from seed stage to A, a to series A to, you know, market uptake. And like in that path, how can we at S2G offer them services? Similarly, we're looking at like across BV, how can we be a resource for those kinds of transitions for access to resources you might otherwise have on that journey. Well, here's what's that. So one thing from our experience, Bruce, that parallels that as an NGO, we also yeah. have a holding company and several for profits that we own, uh, uh, two of which you you you, you all have invested in. In, the, in those quotes, fascinating to me about the difference is when you invest in a for profit, you don't pick a line item, you don't pick a program. Right. You don't you have no say over how that money gets spent. You right. are investing in the leadership and you're investing in the, you know, the idea, the market, the research, et cetera. Further, as soon as the company starts to 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 take off, once the, you find product market fit, you're raising money to market for marketing dollars in order to grow your consumer base in a consumer product. We happen to have a, you know, the the video game that you and I uh, uh, have talked about. And and yet in the nonprofit arena, that I very few foundations would ever talk about giving a grant to boost fundraising, um, to boost marketing, unless it's linked to a particular policy outcome. So I I think that's there's so so many of these conversations I think are eventually going to get back to how can we also reform the system within our around our relationships. Well, very much. I, I just having been on that nonprofit side of that, like just what you you don't walk into McDonald's and ask what their overhead is. <laughs> it's the first question everybody asks a nonprofit, right? It's like, but so yeah, I mean that you're preaching to the choir for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So enough, enough from me. Uh, other questions from our from our uh, terrific audience. Uh, we still have about 180 people hanging around. So let's uh, let's jump in. What else, Stephanie? Yeah. So we've had several questions questions on carbon markets. Here's one. How is philanthropy considering collaboration with private carbon financing mechanisms through the voluntary carbon market? Hmm. Well, philanthropy broadly, 
we often invest in carbon markets as a kind of a um, an ancillary kind of byproduct to the work we're doing on soil health or on oceans health or like, but we think about carbon markets. Um, we're not the experts, but there certainly is a role to play in the voluntary markets, as we know. Um, they have such potential, and yet you know, there's been some hiccups along the way. And I think, uh, you know, I was on a call yesterday where um, uh, a, a consortium of folks, philanthropy and non and NGOs and the, and and the like are thinking about like in this instance about just bringing some much more kind of uh, universal certainty to the kind of standards to compliance. So what do we mean when we talk about permanence to on the um, and and kind of carbon markets, voluntary carbon markets 2.0. But who's gonna uh, who's gonna pay for that kind of work that goes in? Well, philanthropy could pay for that, um, and um, and can be a convener in some instances when many people know that this needs to happen, and yet they're working in their own ways. And so I don't wouldn't hold us out as the ultimate global convener of that. But there are a consortia of of, of donors and philanthropists and um, who can bring credibility to this, um, who can bring even expertise to this. Uh, but can help be that kind of convener of like, how do we collectively think about this next level for carbon markets? Or we can think about trading with assurance that what I'm trading has the value that I am, that purports to have, that we get beyond greenwashing and all the expert and all the kind of the dampening that that puts on what is a, a really interesting uh, opportunity. And then of course, there's the pathway from voluntary to compliance markets and um, philanthropy actually, I think, has a meaningful role to play in that as well. Great. Let's do let's do two for one. Uh, ask two questions, Stephanie, and we'll we'll let Bruce bat them around. Oh, great. So this one is actually a um, direct opposite of that last question. How do we increase private investments in areas of nature restoration that are not directly linked with carbon capture credit markets? Hmm. Uh, well, oh. Well, I'll, I'll that one. I, I just think like rare knows this world. I, I'm keenly interested in, you know, this world and like ecosystem services and how do you price them? And carbon is something that we is beginning to be understood. But, you know, there are all kinds of things that nature does for us. I'm thinking of pollination services. Like, what would you do if there were no pollinators? What would you pay for that? And like, how do you begin to put a price on that, you know, water filtration. You think about tourism itself is a way to kind of monetize the value of nature. There are many ways to do that. And there are, you know, entities that uh, are working on that. We work with a, a number of IEG who's thinking about natural asset companies and like applying kind of value to a company whose ownership is in natural in, uh, in, in natural assets, in land or in ocean conservation or the like. So, um, I think there's a lot to do there that's very interesting. In the end, it it can't, it's 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 tantalizing to think about, it's exciting to think about. There's a little thing that grates where you say, why do I have to put on that value on nature? For God's sake, nature is self-evidently valuable, but like, but by the way, there's also a value to biodiversity that can be monetized. Um, you know, and there are actually standards for doing the UN has something like 38 standards for value and ecosystem services. So it's interesting to think about the different models that go beyond uh, carbon. Next next one, Stephanie. All right, this is probably our last one, but we'll see. Um, how can foundations with their philanthropic funding cultivate more robust ecosystems for market-based solutions aimed at alleviating poverty? Um, so I used to think about, I still do think about this a lot. Um, yeah, this was your day job at one point. My day job at one point. And 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 it is the kind of uh, a, a couple of things. One is I think um let's not um put kind of uh alleviating poverty solely on the back of market-based solutions and it, it's foolish to think that that's uh, philanthropy has many mothers fathers whatever you want to say um and I mean, sorry, uh, poverty does. And but um I do think that um in many instances, giving people the access to capital, the access to skills, the access to networks, uh, and doing that in ways that initially will be subsidized um, because you've got to organize the market, because you've got to have aggregate sometimes producers, because you have to think about kind of 
reaching out, like, who's your market? You have to solve for some market that that does take some philanthropic investment. Um, thinking about setting up a business accelerator for folks, as, as we were talking about earlier in the call, for folks who may have kind of a, a really good idea, but don't know how to monetize that and have never had access to the networks or to the capital um, or the know-how to, to do that. There's nothing intuitive about starting and growing a company. It's just not, and particularly as you grow. Um, so how do we give people those skills? Um, and philanthropy can do a lot to do just that. And then beyond that, thinking about where does philanthropy pay in, in the provision of concessionary capital that gets you to market rate capital uh, uh, and the like. But I think um, particularly now, I think applying a explicitly equity lens to how we think about the development of market opportunities for people and thinking about what does it mean really to think about equity in an opportunity context, in an access context. Um, and I think people, more and more people, I think do do that. So again, I think there are ways that uh, kind of market-based approaches kind of have to be engaged in ending poverty. Look, there's, and I wouldn't say it's always philanthropy. It may just be the markets. Like in the last, I don't know, 15 years, something like 400, pe 400 million people lifted out of poverty in China. And a lot of that was just market-based opportunities. So uh, I would never short sell uh, uh, that. And I think it's critically important. It's what I spent my career doing and it's not the entire answer. <laughs> and a lot of policy work in China, meaning authoritarian or otherwise, that a, a, a very technocratic ability to make those markets very much. Yeah. And I, yeah. a little bit of like, careful what you wish for, but yeah. <laughs> so we are, we are now at the hour. So Stephanie, what all I'm going to say is um, Bruce McNamer is the president of Builders Initiative, uh, the philanthropic team at Builders Vision. Uh, he works with a very talented cast of very good people and uh, is a great partner to Rare. So we are thankful to have you, Bruce. Thanks for taking the time and for uh, helping us understand the links between finance philanthropy, and nature. Last word to you, my friend. Well, just thank you, Brett. Love Rare. I've always loved Rare. Since we met 15 years ago, and I heard kind of the path you've been on, and I think that's shared with us here, feel like kindred spirits. But really, thank you to this audience uh, for, you know, I feel like a lot of fellow travelers here. And so thank you to you for your work that you do. All right. Cheers, everybody. Have a great day. Take care.